Listener Production. The creators of this podcast would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which it is recorded. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are the first storytellers of this land. We pay respect to their elders, past, present and emerging, as well as any Indigenous people who may be listening today. Everyone relax. This is Type Up. I'm Charlie Clawson. Oh, I'm Will Anderson. Hello, and thank you for watching. I've got a thumbs up in return yeah. there from well, Charlie. Well, I think it's the best one we've done. Like, I've been most prepared for it. and We did two we did in two a row, row, too. This is like, this is, you know, back-to-back recording. So we had the practice So run. I need to give you one well, back. we did it. Like, so what do you do? No. Uh, and so, no, firstly, I do um, hand, up. Uh, I do hand, hand up. Stop. Stop. Back up. Rolling and it back then up. Back of the hand. Yeah. <laughs> and thumbs then up. Thumbs up. I wonder if I should just do like something like that. <laughs> <laughs> this is good, good, good chat for a mostly audio podcast. I just pointed at Will. Go to the Patreon. <laughs> you can get a video of Charlie pointing at me. Uh, we said last week we we're going to do a mailbag episode, and yes. that is true. We have a lot to get through. So without any further ado, um, this is from Dom. Hey, Will and Charlie, thanks for indulging the – oh, by the way, I should point out this is actually a Patreon message. Uh, we have a whole other mailbag okay. we need to get to at some point, but I felt like this one was worth dragging out of the Patreon okay. bag to read. Uh, thanks for indulging the brief intrusion by me and my fiance at halftime of the Saints GWS elimination final. That was me. Um, uh, did I say Charlie? Charlie Charlie and Will. It was just me. <laughs> Uh, we were sitting a few rows in front of you and noticed you in the crowd and debated as TOEFOP fans of five plus years whether or not to come up and say hi or whether the polite thing to do would be to leave you alone given the stress of the game. We ultimately decided it couldn't be more stressful than watching Max King kick for goal in the second quarter. My question to you uh, both to you both, in re- is in relation to the live show in November. You've continually mentioned it's been six to seven years since the last live show, but I distinctly remember going with my friend Max to a TOEFOP gig in 2019 in a warehouse in Collingwood during the day. On a Friday during the comedy festival, Foz was a guest and the bathroom was weirdly close to the stage. Yes. Yeah. So technically that wasn't a TOEFOP that was live a show. Foz, that was us. That was like a Foz show. Yes, Cheeky boy. That was a Foz fop. He was. Uh, yes. That was the launch of his art. That's right. He, yes. So yes, technically I guess in a way that was a live performance, but that feels to me like, that wasn't the. I can't remember how I worded the press experience. release, but I might have said our first time on stage in six years. But technically, we weren't on stage. We're in a warehouse that was weirdly <laughs> we close to the, the floor. Toilet. It was definitely on the floor. We were on the <laughs> sitting ground. on stools <laughs> on the ground in a warehouse <laughs> in a close proximity to the toilet. Um, uh, he continues. Uh, there was a 15-year-old boy in the front row who attended with his mum, who had specifically yes. taken him out of school for the occasion, much to your amusement. I'm starting to think we Mandela affected the entire thing, but let us know. Uh, no, that definitely happened, cheeky boy, but we do not count. It's not canon in TOEFOP Lives. We sort of count comedy festivals, um, LA Podfests, and Just for Last. They're the TOEFOP Lives. It was James's event, yeah. and we just and came it. along and did a bit of our shtick, yeah. but it was for James. It was this, It was at an art gallery. A mum could bring her 15-year-old child to the <laughs> Uh, anyway, thanks for the chat, Charlie. Definitely made our day on what was otherwise a pretty glum one for Saints fans, and thanks for the laughs over the years. Uh, yeah, you, no, I remember you coming up and saying hi. It was a, it was totally fine. It was completely relaxed. If you'd come up during the game, that would have been annoying. Like if someone is trying to like gets in front of you while you're trying to watch football. But you waited at halftime. I was easily accessible. And you well, did polite. you see that bit? Of, there was a famous photo from the AFL Grand Final this year of uh, Anthony Albanese and uh, Gillian McLaughlin, the head of the AFL, like having a selfie like like with two minutes to go when the game was still really close and they weren't looking at the game. And like I was like, the bravery of the person who came and said, can I get a photo of you at that time in that game? Like – this is the perfect time. <laughs> but uh, well, when there's two minutes to go on one of the closest grand fighters, like, this is my moment. I should go over and get a photo. It is a weird impulse, isn't it? Like, so how long to go? Like, a, two minutes to go. Like, just wait. Two minutes when to go. everyone's celebrating it in a good mood. <laughs> like, it's. I think they were like, I'm going to miss my opportunity. I think they'll all leave. They'll probably go to some function or something like that. Yeah. 
they'll be immediately whisked away. I've got to do it at the most tense part of the game. I've got to do something that's clearly going to be captured on the cameras and shown to everybody that the head of the AFL and the head of the country aren't watching Have the game. you ever been photographed with a prime minister? Like have you met with one or been interviewed one or been on one of your shows or anything? Yeah, I've met many prime ministers. Prime Not ex prime ministers. But- this doesn't count. I mean, like when someone's been like act like in in the prime minister ship, have you met with a what do you call them, an active prime minister? So hang on. So you, in your rule, it doesn't count if I've no because you. Met I want to know why. Do you prime have minister? the ear of the most powerful person in the country? Not like someone who got turfed out. Doesn't count. <laughs> When I was at the uh, Finn Review working in the press gallery, I once gave Paul Keating the finger. What do you mean? Um, well, are you familiar with the finger? It's quite famous. It's the finger that we're talking about, the middle yes. finger. The famous- I know what the finger is, but why did you give yeah, that yeah. particular <laughs> famous finger to Paul Keating? So uh, to paint the scenario- I can't I believe I haven't heard this press- fucking story before. <laughs> I'm not sure you have. Okay. There's no way that I haven't rolled this out at some stage. Um, but I was working in the press gallery and the way the press gallery works, if everyone just wants to imagine a corridor, there's a string of offices. Each of the media organization have an office. They're all next to each other. The Sydney Morning Herald one looks much like the Fin Review one, which looks looks much like the Herald Sun one. They're just offices all next to each other in this corridor of Canberra. And everybody was out at something. So probably parliament. That's normally while everyone would be out of the office. I was the only person in the office, my desk was the first desk as you come through the door because I was essentially the office, you know, direct you to somebody person and everybody was out. And so I had my back to the door and I was watching something on the computer or reading something on the computer or something like that. I had long hair at the time and uh, from the door, someone shouted out, since when have they let people have long hair at the financial review? And I just thinking it was another, you know, journalist or idiot that I knew, like over my shoulder without looking, just <laughs> oh, threw I love it. Look the, at the that rebel. finger. <laughs> Sticking it to the man. <laughs> Take your job and shove it. Turned around and it was uh, none other than Prime Minister Paul Keating. I have no photographic evidence of that happening, though. I, I feel like I that will... would not have ruffled his feathers in the slightest. <laughs> it didn't. He found it amusing. Yeah. <laughs> Is my recollection. That's a good story. I can't believe I busted that out. Do you reckon if that was uh, so? I would. Okay. So I go on. Do yeah. you reckon if that happened in the states, you would be arrested? Like you can't do that to. A, I'm sure there's some weird American rule where you can't flip off. Didn't someone a woman flipped off Donald Trump's motorcade and she got arrested or at least questioned by the police? <laughs> What's the question? What, well, like, what what, like it, nothing happened to you. You were able to flip off. Like, it's like that Simpsons yeah. kind of like satire of Australian politics. Like, yeah, gross. They didn't, get, they didn't get the giant yeah, boot. Yeah. <laughs> now, the Prime Minister was just floating in a giant tire. You flipped him off, and it's like it was all fine. But in America, like you'd be, you'd be, you'd be questioned by the CIA or something. I'm sure. Of it. But what question are the CIA asking you? Did, Did you, you plan <laughs> to turn that finger into a gun? Are you a communist sympathizer? Do you hate our president? Do you know I the I national hate the anthem? President. I gave the president <laughs> and like, the finger. I thought it was pretty obvious what I thought about the president. I don't know. I just feel like America would have a, a law against flipping off presidents. Uh, I also have met um, while he was Prime Minister of Australia. Oh, I've met Julia Gillard while she was Prime Minister before and after and fan. while she was uh, Prime Minister of Australia. I've met uh, – Scott Morrison when he was Prime Minister of Australia when I was doing the radio. But speaking of photos, uh, after we would have guests on our radio show, we would get a photo of them for our social media. And I conveniently had to go to the toilet when that photo (laughs) was happening because I could not bear to have my photo taken with the Prime Minister and he absolutely knew what was going on. (laughs) Made a comment on the way out about, oh, sorry, you missed that photo, Will. Like literally, like, like I thought I was being so... Subtle about it, and he hundred percent. I, I would not have been subtle if it was me. I would have said, "Sorry, I would love to say that I have a stomach bug and explosive, runny, stinking diarrhea. I must yeah. now leave this room to expel <laughs> said excrement from my gut. Stinky, disgusting, much like you did at that McDonald's." <laughs> <laughs> All right, 10 minutes and we've done one letter. <laughs> I've done good stuff. Okay, I, well, I'm sorry. I'm not going to add to this, but I'll be yeah. quick on this. But I do want to give a shout out to the young man who 
when I was at the uh, Woolworths in Bondi, um, because he'll know who he is, (laughs) came up to me and said, oh, my God, Adam Hills. And I, just because I had my headphones on and I was in a shop and sometimes I get mistaken for Adam Hills, didn't realize that he was being funny. Oh, right. like, he, like he was making a joke. He'd yeah. been listening to Adam Hills on Philosophy. Ran into him again a few days <laughs> <No>, later. <what? laughs> he was listening to Tofop. Ah. Like literally listening to Tofop while I walked by him. And I acted weird in front of those <laughs> guys. <laughs> That's like, thing. don't worry about it. <laughs> I did not. It, well, I was trying to be polite. But I just didn't like, you know, just when you head somewhere else and like something surprising happens and you just don't really know how yeah. to. Like, it wasn't like I was mean spirited, but I certainly don't think that I gave, like, I didn't even ask his name, which I wish I had of in retrospect, like, actually stopped and said, What's your name? But yeah. I, like, literally was just a bit thrown by the whole. I did the exact uh, same thing. I told um, James Clement about it when he was on Fofop, where I had. A guy, I was starving, looking for somewhere to eat in Melbourne. I left my hotel and couldn't find a fucking cafe. And I was getting to that sort of hangry point. And I was sort of going through the, the Collins Center and this guy stops me. And I look up and he just holds up his phone to show the existing to Tofop. And he was really polite about it and stuff. But I was just so caught in the back foot that I was horribly awkward and kind of shoved him aside to go find somewhere to eat. And I talked about it on, uh, with to James and... And he said, well, you can, you know, just apologize now if you want. And I did. And then the guy got in contact and he said it was fine. I wasn't offended. It was a weird, it was weird on both sides of the equation. Oh, well, this guy's clearly a big fan. So I've said this specifically <laughs> for this message to get to okay. him. <laughs> like, no doubt. I wasn't even really saying it to you. I could have just said it <laughs> right, at the start okay. of the episode before you got here. Excuse me, mate. I've been thinking about this. <laughs> Apologies for being awkward. All right. This is from David. Uh, magpies. Dear Charlie and Will, I just listened to 471 where Charlie related his recent magpie attack. I was listening while a local maniacal magpie was swooping me Mm. on my morning ride. All of the things Charlie mentioned are true. Uh, They have a 30-year life expectancy. They remember faces and they are protected. Uh, They've stopped swooping. Swooping season's over. I haven't been swept in a couple of weeks, so it's happy ending. Charlie, yeah, but it's it's not over because I'm going to read you from the – it might be by the time people hear this, it might be over, but – uh, just uh, 10 days ago uh, in the um, the Age, in the Sydney Morning Herald, there was an article that I thought that I would bring your attention. Uh, uh, swooping season starts in late September and doesn't relent until early November, apparently. Uh, so uh, there are many reasons people thought they might be attacking us. Mm. So we've explored some of this, but this is an expert. Uh, from They Hate the Colour Purple. <laughs> the movie? Yeah, Anything no, with Ruby Goldberg. <laughs> Not big fans of Jumpin' Jack Flash <laughs> or Sister Act. <laughs> Neither. <laughs> or t- Sister Act 2, which I've heard is better, but <laughs> they don't like that either. Uh, they were, co- Or they were collecting hair for their nests, right? right? Uh, oh. This uh, expert has been uh, researching magpie swoops since the 80s. Over the years of research, Jones has disproved theories that magpies swoop due to spike in testosterone or a detaste for lilac. The most obvious hypothesis was true. They're defending chicks. Once baby magpies leave the nest, the swooping stops. So, Okay, so up until now, I think we're just like, we we pretty much knew this information, right? Only 10% of magpies, mostly males, uh, are the ones who swoop. What we don't understand is why certain individual birds become obsessed with people. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why it's an obsession, but I mean, it, it kind of like if you anthropomorphize this magpie, so every day, Will, oh, I ride to the gym and there's a guy on the corner and every time I ride past, he chases after me and he starts swatting at me yeah. and with no reason. And I've tried all these, I've tried giving him food, I've tried threatening him, I've put eyes in the back of my helmet, nothing to do. You're right. It does sound like obsessive behavior, doesn't it? Well, this article is going to be good for okay. you. You'll, you'll, I think you're going to learn a lot. So the expert continues because none of the people who get swooped every year have climbed a tree and eaten a baby magpie. Well. So, <laughs> clearly, they must have a really low threshold of what they regard as a threat. So aggression intensifies over the season for two reasons. At the beginning of the season, a magpie gives a really specific call that says, hey, I can see you coming towards my nest. Keep away. 
I know it. That's a call we don't recognise oh. because the expert continues, we're not magpies. But they do make Faced, a noise. I can, can confirm they make, they a, make noise. a noise before they swoop. Faced with an ongoing procession of pedestrians and cyclists, the magpies up the ante to warning swoops well above people's head, which goes unnoticed. By the end of the season, they've done this hundreds of times and they're absolutely exasperated. That's when they start making contact. The second reason is more evolutionarily valuable as they grow because- Sorry, just uh, on the exasperated point. Yeah. I get yeah. it. You're a dad with like three young chicklings at home. They won't sleep. You can't get them to eat. And then someone goes fucking hooning past your house. Like I've been tempted. When we lived in Sydney, like there was a fucking guy who'd ride his motorbike just to put Iona down. And the amount of times I was like, I had these- Terminator 2 fantasies of just like chasing him down the street and just fucking killing him. I get it, magpies. You and I are not so dissimilar. Maybe, in fact, we're the two sides of the same coin, magpie. How to avoid an attacking magpie. Joan said magpies are stealth bombers and less likely to attack from the front. Back away calmly. Don't run or wave your arms, which could exacerbate the aggression. A magpie may defend 100 metres around its nest. Wearing a hat and sunglasses for protection is sensible, okay. but slapping fake googly eyes on the back <laughs> of a helmet does, does not work. I put Steve Buscemi's eyes. It should have worked. <laughs> does not work. Magpies are very smart, he says. If they can recognise facial features on humans, what are they going to think about a circle with a dot in it? <laughs> it's just ridiculous. <laughs> what? <laughs> I actually found a photo of Steve Buscemi, blew it up, and cut out the eyes. <laughs> like, it wasn't a circle of the dot. Uh, magpies can memorize about 20 faces. So if you live near a swooping magpie, there's a chance you can negotiate a truce. You can turn an aggressive magpie into a peaceful one by so-called befriending it oh, and yeah. providing food. That's been consistent with the advice we've been getting on this show. But it only happens for a person who lives within the territory of a magpie. Okay. So within 100 so there's no, Yeah. Right. So there's no way you can do that down at a park that hundreds of people go okay. through every day. It's, it doesn't work like that. Um, and then uh, there's stepfathers as well. Sometimes the dads fuck off or, you know, something happens and then a, a, a stepfather will come in and they feed the, ch uh, the chicks at – uh, twice the rate of the original male uh, to prove to the female that he's a good stepfather. <laughs> <Is that, yeah, laughs> yeah. I mean, they're more like humans than we realise. <laughs> Love bombs. You can have whatever you yeah, want. Exactly. It's fine. You can have two birthday <laughs> presents. Yeah, come on. Uh, so David says, um, I've got a new strategy for dealing with magpies. Have you ever played a computer game where you're flying, you need to land? Generally, you start higher than your target, line up from distance and glide down to your destination. But what if the landing zone suddenly unexpectedly rose up 20 metres at the last second? You'd have to pull out and try again. So magpies also glide from above on a perfect trajectory to attack your helmet or bump your shoulder. My strategy has been to bend my elbows, get my head right over the handlebars while watching my shadow, which is often off – well, while watching my shadow, which is often off to the side. When the magpie's shadow glides in about a second away from my head, suddenly I straighten my elbows, I tilt my head up, a bit like a push-up, I suppose. The sudden yeah. change of height of my head and shoulders completely ruins a magpie's glide path and they pull out to avoid an uncontrolled collision, a bit like a computer game analogy mm. above. I have head I have head butted to death <laughs> nine magpies. <laughs> <laughs> the magpie may catch you, uh, you by surprise with the first pass, but it won't hit you again if you keep changing your head height on subsequent passes. If you can see your shadow, mm. you can just keep doing push-ups uh, until you're in a safer zone. Um, I, well, I, you know the good news is because your greatest fear is ending up on ground cardigan, <laughs> the fact that you're jumping your head up and down is going to really add to the appeal of that video. I actually have tried it, David. I did do that technique. Yeah. Didn't do shit. My magpie no. is hardcore. Like mine is the – Might be a stepfather. Maybe it's a stepfather. It's the Liam Neeson. Like he has a specific no. set of skills. A set of skills. Clawing, beaking <laughs> – and yeah. screeching. <laughs> he was he was in retirement. Yeah. <laughs> didn't, didn't want to have to That's right. defend another nurse. <laughs> uh, this is from Mel. Hi, guys. I picked up my eight-year-old son from holiday care today and was quick to hit pause on this week's episode titled Dick Pistols. <laughs> mm. um, 
I don't always pause because of profanity, mostly because it gets drowned out by his excited stories of the day. Off we went, chatting about his day. We well, halfway home when he went quiet and immediately knew what was happening. I could hear the cogs turning and it was too late to try and change what was coming on. Mum, why does it say dick pistols on the screen? <laughs> I mean, at least the kid can read, right? <laughs> Cue to me laughing while saying, oh, it's because they call their episodes weird names sometimes. I had nothing more than that for him. Dang, these kids and they're learning to read. Anyway, he giggled because he got away with saying dick and I giggled because why the hell not? I thought this would give you a laugh like it did us. Side note, I want to apologize for how aggressive my fast and furious message was. When you read it out on the pod, <laughs> which I was so excited about, by the way, you sound, it sounded way more angry than I, yeah, that was because I'm, I'm an actor. That's a fucking I, sauce on it. But also, I do remember that it did feel very passionate. <laughs> yeah. I mean, good on you. Like, they're yes. not for me, the Fast and Furious films, but I know they make people happy. And who am I to be a thief of joy? You're Charlie Clawson, <laughs> thief of joy. <laughs> it's literally in your name and your job description. <laughs> Uh, this is from Stacy. Hey guys, I am slowly catching up on the episodes and listen to episode 431. All right, cast your mind okay. back, Will. Mm. Um, Donut Wars, where you had some correspondence about water after bariatric surgery. So do you remember we we talked about people who have that? I think it's like, you know, it's the the uh, thing around your, your tummy. And yeah. there's certain water is like is painful to drink. Like people can't – they have to drink like juices or something like that. Anyway, there's a discussion okay. about – is water, water, <laughs> shit like that. We look at all different – the whole episode's about water, basically. This may have been resolved since then, but I thought I would contribute. I had the gastric sleeve four years ago. I'm not really sure about the exact science of it, but there's a lot of talk on Facebook support groups, and it sees that people who have this procedure can't handle normal water due to the high pH level. It has also been suggested that Fiji water has a different pH I found both waters were very painful to drink at first, but I seem to be fine now with any water. I just can't guzzle it like I once did, especially soon after eating. It kind of sucks in summer when I have to choose between food or water. <laughs> oh, no. But it's a small price to pay for the benefits of the surgery. Thanks for the content, guys. You get me through many long road trips and boring days at work. Uh, glad to hear it. Stacey, are you looking something up? Uh, no, I, I just was thinking about Fiji water because I've I stopped – ever drinking Fiji water because I just think, you know, importing flying water from overseas doesn't seem like it's a really good thing for the environment. Yeah. So, um, but I miss it because I loved Fiji uh, water. Can you tell the <laughs> I know that it feels like water, you shouldn't be able to tell the difference, yeah. but with Fiji really? water, I could always tell the so difference. So, tell me, what describe it. Like, if you were a sommelier, it's made me want to go. Give me the Fiji. sommelier kind of like it's got a hint of whatever. Uh, yeah, well, it tastes like a waterfall. <laughs> Is that the unreleased TLC track? <laughs> that was draft one. Don't, don't go tasting waterfalls. <laughs> Please lick to the rivers and the lakes that you used to. Yeah, it's delicious, Fiji water. I know, it's ridiculous. It is ridiculous, to say that. and I don't believe you. I don't think yeah. – I mean, could you taste test Fiji water with Mount Franklin and pump? I mean, I think that I could, yeah. Could you t taste, t taste test the difference between Mount Franklin and pump? No, absolutely not. I don't think In I fact, could tell the difference between I don't any think of them. You could put tap water next to all three of those and I wouldn't mm. know the difference. I am not a water aficionado. No, no, and again, it's not like there's huge differences, is there? But like, I look so at you, the princess I, and the pea. <laughs> like you can tell when your water is not imported from Fiji. <laughs> no, you, no, it's one of those uh, things that I'm like, this is not like a thing that is good for any reason to get into, right? But in my head, I love trying waters from. Like regions, if there's like you're in Tasmania and like, oh, this is like a local water that comes from like the ice up, blah, blah. Like I actually really like this such that's like I did not know this about myself until I'm saying this out yeah, loud. But it is absolutely true that like I really like trying different water. <laughs> oh, my God. I, who would have thought there would be a sequel to that episode, Donut Wars, <laughs> another one where we get knee deep into water, no pun intended. I – yeah, I've – like there was a company in Australia for I think Tasmania who won like world's best water really? or something. 
And I ordered like a crate of their water to try it and it was I really had good. no idea. Yeah. Like I am not – I'm the opposite of you. I am – you're unbreakable on Mr. Glass because I can – I drink tap water in LA. People are like, oh, you can't drink tap water in LA. I don't give a shit. Like water's water as far as I'm concerned. Oh, I like tap water too. Like so I recently broke my out of glass bottle that was in the fridge that was like my – you know, just fill it up from the tap and then like – and so since then I've just like keep forgetting to buy something new to put water in. And so um, I've had like a few bottles of water and, ah, man, I love tap water compared to most bottled water. You know what I love doing? But Fiji water <laughs> I love, tastes like a waterfall, Charlie. I love drinking from a garden hose like a dog. Oh, yeah. And I know yeah, that yeah. that's wrong because it's not filtered or whatever, but fuck, man, like just blasting that water into your mouth. Like you've been doing like mowing the lawn or something. It feels so fucking yeah, like a solo, also, man. <laughs> like it's not filtered been or whatever. You've working hard but, like, to be a garden hose man. <laughs> for like 99% of like – human civilization people have been happy with a puddle yeah. like yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know you're talking to yourself mate and fucking importing <laughs> crates of water in tassie you don't have to convince me i'm telling All you that I'm, I am saying that. Is I'm still drinking I've, a puddle <laughs> i feel like i would go to fiji just to drink fiji water where it's from <laughs> And then I just the whole time I was there, I'd just be like, like, do you just water. call it water here? <laughs> Can I have some water? Like <laughs> They're like, we don't drink that. We just sell that to tourists. It's just yeah. the real Fiji yeah. water. <laughs> yeah, like, oh man. There's a there's a, there's a better Fiji water. <laughs> yeah. Uh this is from Paul. Hey, I'm a regular TOEFOP listener, but needed to bring your urgent attention to something. I was listening oh, to an episode- our, mail, our, our mailbag is not the best way to bring urgent <laughs> attention yeah. to something. Um, I was listening to an episode today during the ad break, and I heard an ad, an honest-to-God actual ad. I'm not sure if this was an error from my podcast feed, as I don't recall hearing ads during any of the designated ad breaks previously. This occurred during the FOFOP with Friends interview with the guys from Silverchair. I suspect it was a full oh, yeah. corporate sell-up move on Charlie's part, and no doubt- no doubt subtle product placement will occur in ongoing future episodes. I'm joking, of course. I hope you're selling uh, real estate on the podcast soon and making lots of money. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, so us too. We we turned on automated ads because uh, we have been trying to get a sponsor this year. It ha has mm. not worked out and we need to make some kind of income. So we've just turned on. It's a good reason to join our Patreon, Will, because you get every episode ad-free. You know, If they are annoying you and you want to support the show, you can go to our Patreon and support for as little as a dollar a month, but don't start at the minimum. Maybe start at five bucks. Got to 20, get a fucking free something or another. Poster, that's right. You get a poster sent to you. So yeah, I mean, that that's a good way to listen to it or just, you know what, like it. I, I think people are kind of used to the idea that an ad might pop up in the middle of something these days. We've got them used to it not being a thing because we can't sell a fucking <laughs> ad on our show. <laughs> Uh, this is from Isabel. Mm. Hey, Will and Charlie. There's no good way to start up this question, so I'm just going to get to it. Okay. Oh, I think this is a good way. Yeah. Do you guys eat baby kangaroos? Okay. Interesting. It wasn't related to Australia, but a passing comment from Dave Anthony made on an episode of The Dollop, 598, New York Oysters Part 1, got me thinking, like the way veal is a thing with cows. Full disclosure, I'm vegetarian, so I abstain from it all. And why I could Google it, I don't really want to go down that rabbit hole. Fair enough. Or the Joey pouch. Don't want to, don't want to crawl into that Joey's pouch. <laughs> so I figured I'll pose a question to you guys. I live in the United States and always thought that kangaroo was similar to the way people eat deer over here, in which case it wouldn't, there wouldn't be an equivalent to veal when it comes to kangaroo. But now I guess I'm unfortunately curious. Uh, well, I think you're kind of on the money. Kangaroo is like game meat over here and you do eat it. I eat kangaroo. Will's vegetarian, obviously. I'm vegetarian, but kangaroo is – it's not wild, widely eaten, but you can get it from it, like a major supermarket, though. Not, not exactly. Every no, and and like a lot of pet food and stuff is kangaroo yeah. meat. I like it. Um, I think it's a really good. I, I mean, as, as the meat eater on this show, I think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's vitamin rich. It's zero fat. It's really good for you. It tastes yeah. amazing, and we should be eating and more of it. Yes, it, well, they, it's sustainable yeah. because there are kangaroos. Like, despite the fact oh, yeah, that we sorry, like to pretend- Oh, yeah, sorry, because it's sustainable. Not because I hate kangaroos <laughs> have been asking for it. 
<laughs> that's the reason why we should be eating more. Just, I agree with Will. It, Just in case. It's our, it is our national emblem. The emu and the kangaroo are a national emblem, and I think people sometimes find that confronting that we're a country that eats our own national emblem. But, yes, they are – in huge numbers, kangaroos, and so yeah, it's sustainable to to be able to hunt them. So um, I've never heard of anyone. I eating don't a joey. think that there's like a joey. No, like I think I feel like that's even a bridge too far for Australia. Like yeah, we'll eat a kangaroo, yeah. but I feel like that national pride would would have would yeah, have that not, kind not of joey, hypocritical mate. double standard. Gone too far. Gordon Gordon Ramsay comes to town and he goes, I've actually prepared it in its own pouch. Yeah. Oh, it's a very beautiful and then we've, yeah, like no thank you. No, but also is that um they're not very big. Like that would be part of it as yeah. well. Like I don't think the you're meat's getting quite lean off the of the yeah. adult. So I imagine like you'd be getting even less of a joey, be a lot of skin and bones. Yeah. <laughs> All right, this is from a Drew. Hey, boys. Last time I emailed, I was a year nine student in New England in the US. Ah, second email from America. Oh, nice. Do now either of you know I'm the rock? 35 years old. <laughs> <laughs> now, in my final year of uni, doing a screenwriting major, I have to admit that Will has influenced me in a way I've never expected. Oh, I don't oh know if you know Charlie, but Will is off social media. And now so oh, am yeah, I. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, yeah, I'm off social I didn't media. I know that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and actually, so are a growing number of Gen Z and Gen Alpha people. Are we at oh, Gen Alpha now? Man, we're awesome. starting. This this could be. This is like we, this is how we can get some online buzz from all these people who are not online. Uh, yeah, you got to listen to the previous episode to understand <laughs> can, what Will's talking we can about. Get some, some offline buzz. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. That would be the perfect irony. We do get incredibly popular, but yeah. only amongst people but who no can't one, share that information no widely. No one can tell anyone about it. <laughs> it feels very tofu. <laughs> <laughs> That. that is the perfect ironic punishment for us. And it's your fault because <laughs> you got on social media. Um, like Will has mentioned, yeah, you inspired a generation to get on social media. And because of that, they love our podcast, but no one knows about it. So we stay niche forever. Fuck. You have to listen to the previous episode to get all this. Uh, uh, like Will has mentioned, once yes. I deleted my socials, I had no interest in going back and it's been a great change for me. My only question is, what does Will think about his monumental influence on these generations? <laughs> <laughs> Fuck off. This is if this is how it ends, I'm not okay with it. <laughs> uh, it's like it's not enough that we can't get social media traction. <laughs> I'm driving people who do like our show away from being able to pass on that information to anybody. <laughs> Oh God! Thanks for always keeping me laughing these years, and keeping uh, yeah. and being with me through a few busy years and many more to come. All the best, Drew, and good luck with that. Yes, um, indeed, mate. Screenwriting career. I mean, maybe Drew writes this like great movie about and incorporates us in some way in this movie. Well, as we mentioned in the previous episode, and the reason we keep bringing it up is we just recorded it just before <laughs> we're doing two <laughs> no, in a row. No, 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 we're doing mind memory <laughs> and we're trying to rec recollect everything that happened a week ago. But how would we be the first cool portrayal of podcasters? Mm. Like I know you said Only Murders in the Building, like it's a good portrayal, mm. but like, we're you know, the fictional version of us, the two based on us, you know, fictional well, I, I feel like it's a like 500 days of summer pixies in the lift sort oh, of yeah. reference or whatever that was. Yeah, yeah, like reference. it's a meat like, cute moment. Hey, what are you listening yeah. to? Tofop. You yeah. mean those two guys from uh, yeah. Arsie? Yeah. 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 Those two Arsie guys? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I love them. Yeah. I feel yeah. their earlier work was a bit a bit more juvenile, <laughs> but by episode 100, they really found their, their, their voice. And I like the way their opinions yeah. changed. Potato scallops, potato scallops. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just. This is the be great. That'd be great if they just like turned to each other and like if we just like um, started the new episodes, work your way backwards, <laughs> yeah. just start laughing. Uh, this is from Ellie. Mm. Hello, hey Ellie. guys, I'm a long time listener, first time writer, and I'm a doctor. Hello. It's been a while since we had one of you. 
Well, it's been a while since we've too busy bloody it's, colluding it's with the mail. pharmaceutical companies to create the bloody the the scamdemic. That's where they, all the doctors have been. Oh, by the way, like there was a. Oh, I'm going to have to look at this up because the beautiful Hamish Blake, who we absolutely love, you know, part of our extended Tofop universe, will claim him. <laughs> well, yeah, he's been on Velocity. Okay, does that count? A couple of times. All right. That counts. Okay, that's definitely that. That counts, mate. Okay. Um, this is, uh, I mean, the family is a very broad church. If you say it's part I mean, of the family, to, <laughs> he's to, been to on philosophy once. Who else is twice. part of the family? He's, well, in Hamish's case, that counts, okay. right? Like, I mean, you just want to be of, friends with Hamish, and so you're bringing yes, him into the family. That is exactly <laughs> right. So uh, you'll enjoy this yeah. though, because Hamish has a very popular podcast with Andy Lee. Uh, Hamish and Andy, you, you might have heard, heard of it. it. Uh, <clears throat> Here's an article from, uh, this is uh, from October the 12th, Charlie. Hamish Blake has apologised to, uh, over a joke he made about, so the the important words here are, who has Hamish Blake had to apologise to? Um, so, uh, is it a group or a collective? A collective, Okay, yeah. yeah. Um, has, uh, has had to apologise to... Um, um, uh, and think of what brought us to this conversation. Um, why did I, why did uh, I uh, suddenly the medical look community. this up? Oh, beautiful. That is 100% okay, correct. Right. Hamish Blake has apologised to the medical community yeah. uh, over a joke he made about- COVID? No. Oh. General practitioners. Oh, God. What did he say? <laughs> the TV personality and comedian- Cracked a joke on his Hamish and Andy podcast last week saying being a GP was the highest paying job he could probably do with ease for one day, which, by the way, <laughs> feels like a very tofop <laughs> topic. I think we did a whole episode on that. <laughs> the quantum leap yeah, episode, yeah, right. basically. Um, I do a lot of Googling at medical issues and I've now got 20 years experience of going to the GP. He joked of his credentials. Uh, so pe- the doctors have got mad, the GPs have got mad. Uh, the 41-year-old said he had the greatest respect for the profession and he was not shitting on GPs because they're very good and you do need to go to medical school. So <laughs> so what I loved about this was I thought we were the number one medical podcast and yet of all the dumb things we've said about doctors and people in the medical profession, we've never once been asked to apologise. Like, no one's ever demanded an apology. I, think, for, I think we've been very reverential of the medical I mean, community. I don't think we've, I know. we've never dismissed. In fact, we've always put them on a pedestal. Really, yeah. in fact, we've berated our other yeah. listeners who aren't in the medical profession and I said, mean, "Why are you more like them?" Like, is this is this our moment to capitalise on Hamish's gap? Yes, that's <laughs> like embrace. <laughs> There's one show that respects <laughs> loves and no, number one all health professionals. <laughs> uh, I was listening to Toe. This is Ellie. I was listen. I yeah. listened. Sorry, I listened to Tofop at night to help me turn off my brain and get to sleep. I love that. I, as we've discussed previously, I love. You know, I've started doing that. Listening to boring podcasts to get to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Great. That felt good until then. <laughs> I love philosophy. It's my favorite. <laughs> I recently got back from Europe and in the jet lag haze, I had to head back to the back I had to head to the back catalogues for more Tofop goodness. Last night I was listening to episode 351 from September 2021, where Charlie was chasing down the Remington 4045 4045 beard trimmer. <laughs> he had one coming from America. Wasn't sure if it would work in Australia, but then we never had an update. I'm now mm. so invested. I assumed it worked, giving there was no rant following. But how did it go? Okay. Um, yeah. So I don't know how you missed it, but yes, the shaver arrived. Uh, it indeed came with an American plug. Um, I was talking about plugging it in or like just sticking it into an adapter or something like that, and had a bunch of electricians say, "Don't do that." Um, I was able to buy the right Australian plug in the end, and you know what? After all that fucking drama. I don't like the beard trimmer anymore. Like actually the one that I bought that I was annoyed with, it started the whole me going online and trying to replace this Remington. I like the new one much better. So it was all for fucking nothing. Like if I just <laughs> accepted my purchase and given it like a couple of guys and went, you know what, maybe this yeah. beard trimmer, I would not have even. I don't, I don't like this thing. It's new yeah. and different. <laughs> it was like a 
Perfect example of buyer's remorse. Like I got on the pod, you know, like within 24 hours of buying this fucking razor. And uh, yeah, so I did get everything in now. It's um, it's just sitting in my medicine cabinet unused. That was a good, that was a good subplot, that beard trimmer saga. I'd put that up there with uh, the magpie saga. <laughs> All right, this is from Ronan. Hey, guys, I was wondering if you guys could do a classic Tofop lyrical breakdown of the ABBA song, Money, Money, Money. My boyfriend and I did it at karaoke last week. When I got home, I was interested to find out what the song was about. Um, According to Genius, it is in part an anti-taxation song. Who knew ABBA was so conservative? Knowing the members of ABBA were married at the time, it could also be a passive-aggressive way of Benny and Bjorn accusing Agatha and Frieda, I don't know which ones were married, so I'm just guessing, of being gold diggers. Anyway, thought it might make an interesting topic of conversation. All right, you got the lyrics there? I work all night. I work all day. To pay the bills, I have to pay. I mean, that's too much work. Like, you can't be working all night and all day. Like, you're not serving one of those jobs well. My immediate response is, uh, like, you've just got to spend less. If we, what are all these bills yeah, for? You've, you've, got, you've, you've got, got a good, cash flow. You have got a cash flow issue. Yeah. Gizmos and gadgets. <laughs> maybe subscribe to one less. Oh, it's the 70s, isn't it? There's no streaming services. I mean, get a better job or something. Yeah. Because, like, you just. Too much avocado on toast, bloody Benny and Bjorn to and Frida and Agatha. So I work or not, I work all day to pay the bills I have to pay. Ain't it sad? And there never seems to be a single penny left for me. Oh, okay. So that implies somebody else, mm. like, is getting the money. There's none left for, you know, old mate is working all day long. And the all women are long. singing it. Are we attributing it to them? Because I think it gets into specifics about <sighs> I want to be with someone rich, right, doesn't this song? Well, we'll see, I guess. Uh, that's too bad. In my dreams I have a plan mm. if I got me a wealthy oh, man. There you go. Okay, so well, maybe this is a bit more like, you know, like women aren't getting paid enough. Yeah. Like, you know, I have to work double the amount to get like the same amount of money yep. like that somebody else can do. Maybe I've got some dude leeching off me like and I'm working all day long and like all night long as well. In my dreams I have a plan. If I got me a wealthy man, I wouldn't have to work at all. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, that's too far the other way. You can still work, <laughs> you know. <laughs> like <laughs> Still keep your eye in, you know. Yeah, like it's okay. <laughs> like, Maybe you need a holiday. It sounds like you're just now you're your just eye. leeching off someone yeah. else, right? Like, like you, you should have empathy for this. You're the one who. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> then that guy starts having to pay all your bills. Yeah, I mean, it just right. becomes a, like a vicious he cycle. Has a dream that he wants to meet a wealthy woman. Yeah, <laughs> and on it goes, and on and on it goes. Uh, I wouldn't have to work at all. And you know what she would do? What? She'd fool around and have a ball. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, can you hear that? Like my neighbours have just cranked the stereo and it sounds like they're having a party. It's Sunday night as we're recording this. Right. Okay. Who's a party on Sunday night? Oh, well, cool people. Why am I, I not invited? Because <laughs> <laughs> it's the cool people. Yeah, I guess. I guess so. uh, money, money, money must be funny in, in the rich, rich man's, man's world. world. Okay, so maybe, yeah, maybe this is a little bit about, like, pay disparity, right? Yeah, yeah. Money, 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 always sunny in a rich man's world. Yeah. Aha, all the things I could do if I had a little money. It's a rich man's world. It's a rich man's world. It's funny, isn't it? There's a genre of music Mm. like, uh, you know, uh, Proud Mary, um, Don't Stop Believing, um, uh, uh, living on a prayer, like it's it's all like this sort of blue collar anthems about you know someone working hard just to make ends meet or whatever. Then you go to hip hop. <laughs> it's like motherfucker, I have so much money. You can't believe I got so much money. I forget where it is. I mean, it's that this they were playing on the uh, radio the other day. I was in a car being driven somewhere, and it was like a pop music station you know mm. and um they were playing yeah by usher mm. and it's got that ludicrous like rap mm. in the middle of it do you remember no. that it's like it's i can't remember the rap because like i don't know that song well enough but it's like it's like i yeah can you actually yeah, look up the, up the lyrics yeah. of the ludicrous rap because it is 
one of the the, the most classic sort of he is like a, a famous person rap that they're just doing in the middle of like somebody else's song. The rhymes are ridiculous. <laughs> like it's – All anyway, right, so you, Duke, yeah. is it uh, – watch out, yeah. my outfit's ridiculous in the club yes. looking so conspicuous. Club, co- looking, yeah, okay. And raw, the these women all on the prowl. If you hold the head steady. Hold the head steady, I'm going to milk the cow. Yeah. (laughs) That's the one the dairy farmer's kid really is perked (laughs) up. I was like, is he rapping about milking cows? I never really thought I was going to hear anyone doing rap about milking cows. And forget about game. I'm going to, I'm going to spit the truth. What? I won't stop till I get them in their birthday suit. Yeah. Yeah. So give me the rhythm and it'll be off with their clothes, then bend over to the front and touch your toes. Is that what they're doing? some kind of health check what's going on here (laughs) by the way the little bits that you're yelling are little john little john okay right he's yelling those like you know yeah Uh, i left the jet i left the jag and took the rolls if they ain't cutting then i put them in on foot patrol let's go so uh cutting means having sex i guess um how you like me now when my pink- yeah, here we go. This is the lyric that reminded me of what we were talking <laughs> okay. about. When my pinky's valued over 300,000, let's drink. You're the one to please, yeah. Ludicrous fills cup like double Ds, yeah. <laughs> that's pretty <laughs> but, good. Like his pinky worth 300,000. I was like- When my pinky valued over 300, what's, yeah. why? What's about his pinky? Because he's got a like a pinky ring on. Oh, he's got like right. a diamond pinky ring. Like I, oh, the reason I know that, Charlie, is- after hearing that lyric and not fully understanding why his pinky was worth 300,000, I went to the video clip to actually find out. <laughs> like I was like, is he any, but he flashes the ring at the time. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, okay. Yeah, you're getting – screen's getting darker and darker. We're going to have to wind this up oh. before we get to pitch players. Yeah, sorry. I am um, like – I yes. Work. Uh, all right. So a, a, a man that's hard to find but I can't get him off my mind, ain't it sad – and if he happens to be free, I bet he wouldn't fancy me. That's too bad. So I must leave. I have to go to Las Vegas or Monaco and win a fortune in a game. My life will never be the same. Gambling issues. Gambling addict. <laughs> right. I mean, this person's toxic. Like, <laughs> do not like, get into a relationship with this person. I feel the reason they're working all day and all night is because they're, they're a gambling addict. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this next one is is from a Steve. Okay, now this is going to have to go back to our conversation around back fat. And there was a, you were reading an article, and they talked about um, a condition called, or, or a part of the part of the the body called adipose tissue. So, okay, I this is I have to give some con- context because Steve's really angry. <laughs> hey guys, oh. love your stuff. Although on a cold and windy Dusseldorf day, and we're just fucking reaching the world, aren't we? I know. Yeah. I found myself cursing about the atty thing. I was halfway through this half-cut ranty email when Will did the correction. Yep, it's addy as in adipose tissue, not atty pose tissue. Fat cells. Pretty good name for an Aussie hip-hop mob. So now I've made an ass of myself on German public transport system, uh, pu- German public transport system, cursing loudly in English for something that you quickly fixed. So- <laughs> He's written us an email to yell at something that you did and then immediately corrected. <laughs> That's fucking cancel culture gone crazy. Uh, damn it. It's also why I love you guys. Also, earlier, I got asked by my German colleague why Australians are so racist in reference to the no victory. It took all my self-control not to mention the war while saying, yeah, we have some cunts in Australia. Keep up the good work. Uh, yeah, I mean... What do you say? What a just an embarrassing, disappointing day all around. Yeah, I mean, look, I I saw uh, Tom Ballard's show, which is about the Constitution, and he really like made an excellent point that like if if an issue like this isn't bipartisan, Australia don't vote yes. It's much easier to vote no than it is to vote yes, and I hope that that is not indicative of how Australians re- genuinely feel about the First Nations people of Australia, but there is certainly an element of, like, they, the First Nations people had to be put through so much and have so much stirred up for then there not to be a positive result at the end of it, I think was, like, it feels pretty cruel that they, you know, had to have their value and way of life voted on by a whole bunch of people and then to, like... For them to have extended an invitation and for us to have rejected it, 
I mean, obviously, I voted no. Um, <laughs> you know, yeah. Charlie and I have balance on the podcast. So <laughs> we right. had to. I was like, no, I mean, it, it's, yeah, anyway. I mean, I, it'll, it'll be weeks on when people are hearing this from when it happened. But you, it, are, you I, think are it, not, I think everyone was very aware of what we, we thought. Yeah, yeah. And we obviously, I mean, this is what I was going to say is like, you're not on social media anymore, Will, I believe. Um, but the very, you know, um, we did the minimum amount of showing our support by just putting a couple of things on our social saying, hey, you know, we on the pod are going to vote yes. Everyone, you know, vote how you want to feel, but this is what, what we think. I have never, like in the 13, 14 years I've been on social media, I've never been trolled. And I, we, the TOEFOP and my individual account, like bot trolled. Like I had something like 300 responses to a, a something I put up about the yes vote. And I did that thing, which I never do. I never engage. But this one guy was like, you know, fuck you, funny man. You know, you backed the wrong horse or whatever. And I was just like, oh, I was well, in one of those. He, said, he called you funny man. Yeah. I feel like that's a compliment. Well, he said, he was, I, cause I was like, I, you know, that's cool. Whatever, man. You know? And then, um, he said, come on, funny man. Like when's the next show? And I said, well, yeah, we are doing a show in fact. And you know, you can bring your 11 followers and I'll sit you next to a grown up. who will explain all the big words. <laughs> <laughs> and I felt like I'd kind of like claimed some moral victory. And then he came back with like, you're just a failed fucking comedian. And I was like, dude, I'm not even a comedian. And he was like, that's right. You're nobody. You're a fucking asshole. And I was like, what? I just, so I, after that, I was like, okay, mute this, mute that, turn everything off. But that has never happened to me until this fucking vote. And I just don't, I, like, I don't understand the celebration around like one side winning. And there was this like genuine, like joy at having won something. And I just, I don't understand the, the mentality where you – I can understand having a point of view and some people have contacted me and had more nuanced discussions around they were, why they were voting no. I, oh, yeah. there's, I mean, there's even like arguments to be made like – But the you know, team for, for sport – For a progressive no. Yeah. Like, you know, and I do agree that it was like they were – like some of the arguments around is this really going to help? Like, yeah, I mean, I, I, wor I worried that they weren't doing anywhere near enough and I hope that they will – let this won't let them like you know maybe it was too symbolic like you know maybe there is an opportunity here but it just it felt like also one of those things where you were hopeful that people would you know accept the invitation like the fact that the, this group of people who have had so much you know disadvantage forced upon them mm. had like got together and come up with an invitation for some sort of healing like and a acceptance. Pretty gracious, like a very gracious. They were not asking for a lot. And we <laughs> yeah. went, no. <laughs> yeah. Like <laughs> Yeah. But yes, the weaponization of <clears throat> fear dis and discourse in general. Mm. Like you know, it the, the minute this is why these things don't win if they're bipartisan. They're not bipartisan, right? Because it becomes a we choose a side and we fight this like it's a whereas if everyone is kind of on the same page, you can still have a nuanced discussion around some of the other things. But the minute it becomes political, you know. But yes, there was clearly some, like you said, bots and disinformation and like that it had been organized. But yeah. there was also just the level of anger in the community that got legitimized and stirred up and yeah. people were like, oh, this is great. We can interact with this in the same way as we would interact with. It is amazing the way that they were able to harness the anger people had around COVID and, you know, government distrust and the new world order and link the two issues, like thread that fucking needle. I mean, I've had a few conversations, you know, there's a few alternative thinkers up this way, <laughs> and I've had a few conversations where the mental gymnastics, the way they connect things like climate change being a hoax with also COVID being a hoax. Like everyone's been hoaxed, Will. That's, it's all a big fucking sham. Like it's clearly there's like a, there's, there's a mechanisms and Machiavellian machinations going on behind the scenes. Ah, and when people believe like some of the – because like you said, you can have a nuanced conversation around – the idea of the strengths and the weaknesses of the proposal and like its chances of success. But that idea that, you know, it was a land grab by the UN or any of these things that get flung around, like it's impossible when those things get reported as if they might actually have some <laughs> sort of validity to them. Like it just is not true. Yeah. Like it can't be true. It is so far away from – and we always hear – Every time there's one of these things, like, I mean, the example I used constantly was, remember what they told us would happen if like 
gay people could get married, mm. like cats and dogs having weddings and yeah. like the sky falling in and everything. And no, like nothing happened other than some people in our society felt more accepted in the society and no one else lost anything at all. And we had another opportunity to do something like that and, I, yeah, we didn't, we didn't take it. Yeah, it's just, it's just bizarre to me that anyone would feel threatened or by a decision, an advisory group to make decisions or to give advice on issues which do not impact them in the slightest. Like if you had, if you were in a bubble and you had no idea that this referendum was going on and it was a yes vote, it wouldn't affect you in the slightest. Like your life no. would be exactly the same. I mean, I think it would be a great step in the healing of like for people who don't want to have to think about these things or think, I mean, again, I don't want to get bogged down in this because it's depressing for those who, you know, think the same as us and alienating for those who don't and the votes happen now already. But like th there is a lot of people who argue around that idea of, well, that wasn't me 200 years ago who mm. did that. It wasn't. But it was some of us who did it this time, mm. like a few weeks ago. Yeah. You had an opportunity to say, like, yeah, I'm not like th those people. I, I am different and I, like, look at things differently. And we were offered that opportunity and we decided not to take it as a country. It was – I, I the, found it heartbreaking. The, the biggest oh, – okay, well, this will be the last we'll say yeah, <laughs> because we should probably wrap things up because you are disappearing into darkness. Yes. But <laughs> Both literally and, <laughs> and figuratively. The sooner that Australia can get over this kind of – this belief that we are some kind of egalitarian paradise where everyone, it, like, you know, uh, uh, if you have a go, you get a go, all that bullshit. Like, we've got to let go of that. It's not true. Hasn't ever probably been true. It gives us great pride because it means we don't have to take on challenging ideas because it's all like everything's just too complicated and let's just all keep it simple. But it's we need to have a more sophisticated, nuanced discussion around these things. But it's that the image that Australia, wider Australia likes to think and project it's just not how it is. <laughs> like these laid back larrikins who are in it's a very conservative country. Very conservative in a lot of ways. Well, we don't like to change uptight, the constitution. We don't like to change the constitution. It's much easier in Australia to get a no than it is to get a yes. And like historically, we've always been like that. So anyway, look, I mean, we I could bore you endlessly about this fucking like because I think that the truth of it is that. My hope for this country is that we live up to what we think we are. And I think that the biggest hurdle facing that is that we have not reconciled in any meaningful way with the First Nations people of this country. Like, and I just don't think we can, like, you know, you and I talk on our footy podcast all the time of like both the challenges, but also the strengths that football has like brought to you know like i mean it's got a lot of things wrong and it gets a lot of things right and like it's a it's a challenge and you know like but i i the more that we do it and the more it's incorporated and recognized it feels like football's better because of that like it's better that there's not the racism there in the same way or that they're trying to stamp it out it's better that like indigenous culture and its contribution to the game is celebrated why can't we just do that for the whole country like in corporate, like, you know, I mean, it's not going to be easy and it's not going to fix everything straight away, but I think we're just a better country if we come up with a meaningful reconciliation process with it's, the But it's that perception of Nations being people. egalitarian that prevents people from doing that because it's like we, we can't say anyone's more special. We can't say We're any not. We're saying they're the behind. Yeah. It's not – like it's not egalitarian to go we're all the same if we're starting the race 30 metres in front of them, right? Like – and the reason that they're 30 metres behind is we came and moved in on their track and camped 30 – you know what I mean? Like This metaphor's getting confusing, but oh, I get yeah, it. Yeah, so – you know, again, this is like – let's finish our comedy podcast with this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, it was a letters episode. They were yeah. gonna go, it was going to go in the track. Like, let's finish yeah. with something positive. Okay, this yeah. is from Suzanne. Uh, she says – Hi, guys. Uh, seeing a promo for Pam Air's TV show on SBS brought back great memories of your Pam Air's period during lockdown. These apps were just what I needed as I walked the streets of Melbourne, the Melbourne suburbs, listening to Tofop, Fofop and Philosophy during our many lockdowns. I just wanted to say a big thank you 
you guys really helped me to survive. So oh, that is a positive nice. note there to we go, go out on. We, <laughs> we made some smutty jokes about Pam is and how much she loves sex because of a po- the, the poem about toothpaste, and uh, that brought some joy to people. So that's a good note to go out on. Uh, can I plug our Patreon one last time? Patreon.com slash TOEFOP. Ad-free episodes, full-length videos of TOEFOPs, heaps of, heaps of bonus content worth checking out. Uh, we've also got a live show happening at the Comedy Store November 25th, me and Will and a special guest. Maybe some tickets left, I'm not sure. Sure, we're recording these a couple of weeks in advance, but um, would love you to come. Uh, Will, you have a, a TV show. Oh, yeah, yes. Uh, question everything, ABC iView, if uh, you want to catch up on episodes. But yeah, the more people who watch that, that w- the better. That would be fantastic. And it's been very funny. So many really good comedians uh, on the series and it, good ones booked for the episodes we haven't recorded at this point. So I'm going to assume they were also good. <laughs> <laughs> and you really should go to Patreon to, to check out the video from this How episode. How dark Will is gone. like literally – like broadcasting in complete <laughs> darkness. It's amazing. It's a great setup for a horror film. I'm expecting mm. to see someone in a white mask appear in your window behind you. I mean, what a great way to go. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> Just, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna hit stop. I'm gonna get recording. I'm Charlie Clawson. I'm Will Anderson. Yeah.